Well, let's talk about this with a former Conservative Health Minister, Lord James Bethel. Good morning to you. Good morning, Julia. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it, it is interesting, I mean, you know, the, the government is really hoping, let's be honest, that the public tires of these strikes, uh, strike actions that they did with railway workers and the like, but we know that support for nurses and paramedics is higher, but doctors only third highest. Uh, and people, the majority of people are saying they still support the doctors going on strike. Um, do you think that this will be resolved only when the majority of people turn against the strike? Uh, I, I know what you mean, Julia. There is a, a sense that the RCN and Unison strikes, which are both coming to a vote on Friday, uh, were, were resolved uh, amicably uh, after some time. But I think what's different about this is the severe damage it's doing to the NHS. You're right, it's 350,000 operations. And there are no derogations, even for maternity, uh, for cancer or for A&E. And the impact on patients is going to be of a completely different scale to previous strikes. And I think that is a really big difference in this case. I mean, I mean and it's a very, very big concern. I mean, lots of us will know people, family members who've had operations delayed, cancelled, mm. a lot of them people who've been waiting a very, very long time. And the big concern there also, as you should say, is cancer care uh, being delayed. Uh, and of course, you, you miss one cancer treatment, that can actually put you back an awful lot. It's not sort of, oh, well, I'll go and do it next Monday. That's not how it works. That's right. The, the macro point is that the the, um, the health department did it well in the competition for resources against other departments in the last budget review. Secondary care, the hospitals did well within the healthcare system to get money and social care and public health uh, got uh, a less good deal. Uh, and money has come in to put the healthcare system back on its feet uh, after COVID. So, the, so there should be the resources to improve things in health. This strike is really going to set things back. And that will be felt, as you say, on an individual basis by hundreds of thousands of people. You know, if you miss your slot, your disease may well get worse. Your um, The amount of energy and, and resources needed to, to, to fix you will get greater. And the times being wait, uh, the, the wait times for lots of people are going to increase. It's really going to set the system back a very long way. I mean, you, you, I, agree, I agree with you in all of this, but you were a health minister during a long, long, lot of the period, you know, well, um, you know, we, we were having COVID. Why did you and your colleagues not seem to care when a lot of these services were shut down due to the COVID pandemic? Well, of course, to the services in hospitals weren't shut down. Uh, they, we they, the... they, an awful lot were. I've spoken to people myself who've lost partners whose cancer treatment was cancelled. Yes, yeah, so services weren't cut down. You're right, though. Uh, a major pandemic is going to consume a huge amount of health, limited health resources, and that means no, that things that's, like no, your that's, friends... No, that's not what happened. There was a decision to close down NHS services that had nothing to do with uh, COVID, nothing to do with... The, there were people sitting around, doctors, I've spoken to them myself, sat around twiddling their thumbs because they weren't allowed to have patients in. No, Julia, hospitals were not yes. closed down. GP, GP surgery, GPs were sent home, and it wasn't smart to have a contagious disease um, uh, in GP receptions. And so there was a shift to doing uh, remote access to GPs, and many of those experiments worked quite well. Did but they? the whole system was consumed with dealing with hundreds of thousands of... So I've got, I've, got a friend, I've got a friend who's had treatment for breast cancer, whose mammogram, a routine mammogram, was cancelled in March 2020. So she didn't get her... I had mine, thank goodness me, in, in January 2020, so I was OK. But she didn't have hers. Her cancer wasn't found for two years. Now, she wasn't at risk of COVID. Young, well, young, we say, 50, healthy young woman. Mm. Um, you knew that. Everyone knew. Everyone in government knew that people who were healthy 50-year-olds weren't at risk from COVID at the time. And yet that service was cancelled. Now, she, luckily, her treatment seems to have worked. It might not have worked. But... but I, I do find it very frustrating that you get Tories and Tory former ministers who are saying how awful it is that we've got four days of the NHS effectively sort of being semi-closed down. You've effectively closed the NHS for the best part of six months to anyone other than COVID patients. I mean, it's a bit rich for you to complain about doctors going on strike now, isn't it? Well, Julia, the example you give is a really good one. Uh, your, your friend who missed her mammogram, uh, is, that's absolutely right. Uh, a lot of that kind of screening, those kinds of appointments did have to be cancelled. But this didn't wasn't have to be cancelled. Other countries didn't close down their healthcare services in the same way. Our healthcare system was put under a huge amount of pressure right across the world. I don't think it's that the lady developed. doing the mammograms was working on a COVID ward. Uh, I don't know what she was doing, but I'm I can tell you that right across the system, 
right across the system, it became extremely difficult to get people in and out of hospitals, and a lot of the workforce were reallocated, uh, and these statistics were put into ICU units, were? heart surgeons were put. So right across the board, resources were other reallocated. Other countries and didn't we close down done, their healthcare services to other we, patients. We have done a huge amount to restart things, and that's why I, that's why I feel emotional about this strike because a lot of work has been done right across the board from, from frontline uh, workers uh, all the way through to the allocation of resources to get the NHS uh, restarted and to catch up on exactly the kind of thing that you're talking about. Uh, the the um, waiting lists are far too long and the impact of COVID was really higher. Don't deny that. The impact uh, of COVID moment. policy was also even higher. Let's, let's, let's at least admit, admit that. Can I ask you also about um, the leader of the, uh, the, the junior doctors? Um, he is um, a, a Dr. Rob Lawrence and he's, everyone's types is a militant ex-boarding ex school, of course he is, lefty militants always are, but he's the leader of the BMA Junior Doctors Committee. Uh, he uh, is not going to lo lose any money from the uh, doc being docked for the strike pay uh, because uh, he's gone on holiday for the week during the strikes. What do you make of that? Listen, I don't know him personally. What I would note about this strike is that they have gone in studs first with a really aggressive set of four days right in the middle uh, of a bank holiday to have maximum impact uh, on the NHS, on patients uh, and on waiting lists. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the remarkable lack of derogation to the nurses, as you'll remember, did keep cancer treatments, A&E and maternity uh, going, whereas the junior doctors uh, have stepped back from their responsibilities on that. Julia, this is not a... A Marxist union representing widget workers uh, in non-critical services. These are meant to be the leaders, the future leaders of our healthcare system. They have gold-plated pensions to look forward to, extremely secure jobs and are in the upper range of the pay brackets. So uh, I think it's right that they should be negotiating a pay rise, but the way in which they are doing it is absolutely extraordinary and I find uh, distasteful, frankly.